Good afternoon. Welcome back again. Uh, some of you might have been in part of the Green Urbanism Athena Talks uh, uh, last week on Friday. It was a wonderful event. And uh, now we're back again for the second installment of another Athena series. And I know Galen asked me, you know, tell me all about Athena. What is this? Well, the goddess of wisdom and cities and war, too. Uh, as some of you might know, we have started um, an Athena lecture series of international distinguished female faculty. And out of the 15 talks in the next coming year, this is the second one. Uh, we had maybe less, a couple of weeks ago, Professor Emily Talen of the University of Chicago presenting the first talk. And now uh, we're very happy to welcome Professor Galen Kranz from University of California, Berkeley, to Stockholm because you've been part of also of our green talks last week. This is just a rendering by a very, very famous Russian artist. And it's one of the really nice pictures I like with Athena and her all ready for war, but ready to sort of, you know, educate people around. Uh, so uh, this seminar today uh, will have, uh, oh, there you go, uh, Microsoft. Uh, the seminar today will have uh, uh, the same format as we have uh, last time with uh, Emily Talen, and it's uh, our guest presenter. We'll have a talk around 45 minutes on the topic, and uh, after that, uh, my good colleague and friend, Dr. Helene Litke, will do a reflective comment and exchange some thoughts to together with Professor Kranz. And after that, we'll turn to the audience for a number of questions and uh, reflections and so on. Uh, just as a short introduction, the, the talk today is called Body Conscious Design for Cities, something very, very interesting. I see a lot of interesting chairs here, so I think this is almost a field day for Professor Krantz, because I know you were looking for a very specific chair on Friday, and I was wondering, aha, now I know what it is. Uh, so as I said, a uh, professor at the College of Environmental Design at the University of California, Berkeley. I guess a very famous place in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Still famous today, but uh, almost a seminal place for integration of different disciplines. All, everything from urban geography, urban sociology, environmental psychology, landscape architecture, architecture and planning. So Professor Kranz is a professor of architecture at the University of California, a PhD sociologist from the University of Chicago. Uh, she emphasizes ethnography as a research and cultural, uh, um, uh, as, as a research method. She brings users as well as act creators' perspectives to our understanding of built environments. And on the right side, you can see Professor Kranz's latest book, Ethnography for Designers, in, uh, published by Rutledge, a wonderful book that I recommend to, to all of you. Um, she teaches social and cultural approaches to architecture and urban design. Um, received many, many awards, has been uh, part of EDRA, as our professor guest uh, David Cantor here. Uh, creative work includes research and writing about urban parks, some of the seminal works, and you can see here, um, one of the books is uh, shown on the, uh, on the upper, uh, upper slide. Uh, sustainability, body conscious design, housing for the elderly, and the sociology of taste in environmental design. The book that I mentioned, The Politics of Park Design, A History of Urban Parks in America, published by MIT Press in 1982, is one of the seminal works in the field. And that, from that came the article Defining a Sustainable Park. Uh, she's a frequent lecturer, talks around the world about urban parks, and uh, uh, her latest book, as I mentioned, is Ethnography for Designers. But today's talk is, I think, is slightly different. I I'm not sure we have heard something similar at KTH. And there's a wonderful article that I've sent to all of you, I think to most people, um, about this issue, and also the Q&A or an interview that Professor Kranz gave to one of the magazines. So, with any further ado, I would like to invite Professor Kranz to give the Athena talk. Yes, so do th I thank you publicly for this invitation to be here. Um, um, I had a good weekend. I rested from lots of travels and saw a good fr uh, friend who is an artist here in Stockholm. And I think you have a lovely city that you get to live in. So thank you for inviting me to taste it. Um, I am on a kind of a campaign to change the way the Western world does business, the way we sit in particular. And um, you'd think that sitting might not have anything to do with urban life, but guess what? Urbanites sit a lot, um, like 
12, upwards of 13 hours a day. And um, our public life, we, we sit indoors, of course, but we even sit in our public life and in transport and so forth. So I'm going to uh, take us on a little journey to th rethink this cultural artifact of ours, and then we'll move to the issue of how do we think about that in public places. So, um, whoops, okay. I, want, I need to go immediately to slide 45. Is there an efficient way to do that? Because that's where this talk begins. Oh, I think, wait a minute. No, it's, it turns out it's, uh, we have to go lower than that. Okay. I'm sorry, I, did, I should have memorized the number yeah, and I failed to do so. Yeah. No, much further, it looks like we're gonna be more like it. 60 or 70. We're 93 there. Okay, keep going. Okay. <laughs> All right, maybe it's 146. <laughs> yeah, it could be 146. I knew. Keep going, okay. keep going, yeah. keep going. Whoop, whoop, ah, okay, back. There we go. Back, 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 back. Quite a bit back. Maybe it is 146. Uh, it's, it's okay. there. Let's okay. go to, no, uh, down. <laughs> I guess I could go down at this point. Uh, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. All right, here. Ah, here this, one. Okay. this one. This this one. There we go. Pointer. That was the first that was Friday's talk. You did I put both talks on one stick, okay? So that's the deal. Um, so now we're gonna talk about the like this this cultural device that you're sitting on called a chair. <clears throat> Long ago, uh, when I was teaching at Princeton University, before I had even the slightest interest in chairs, I happened to read an article about the so-called inherent instability of the seated posture. We'll speak, get this thing more up. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Um, is that gonna be, is that good enough? All right. Um, thing is, I may, I'll, get, I'll get steamy on this subject, so I think I might need to take off my jacket <laughs> and hook it this here. Yes. All right. Okay, thank you, all right. So the argument went that when you sit back on a, um, let's see if I get this going, we'll really have everything in place. Yeah, there. When you lean back on the chair back, it said two forces are put in place that take you go back and that takes you both down and forward. And so the body slides forward like this. You've all done this a million times, right? And then pretty soon your pelvis is way out there. And you recognize this isn't really very good for your lumbar spine, it's reversed, so you sit up. And then the article said, at this point, it's okay for a while, but then you don't have any back support, so you have to scoot back for back support, and you start the cycle all over again, and that's what they meant by the inherent instability. When I decided to train mid-career to become a teacher of the Alexander Technique, I realized that there was a cultural assumption buried in that argument. Does anybody know what the Alexander Technique is? Anybody heard of it? One, two, three, four, maybe. Okay, it's a technique of posture and movement developed by an Australian who moved to London in 2004. He discovered this technique because when he was a Shakespearean reciter, when he would lose his voice saying, ladies and gentlemen, um, he went to the doctors like, why do I get laryngitis? And nobody could figure out why. Finally, and they gave him laudanum, which was the heroine of the day, you know, and no, nobody could figure it out. So he figured, since it only happens when I perform, it must be something that I'm doing. He set up a system of mirrors, he watched himself, and he discovered that when he thought he was projecting his voice, he was doing ladies and gentlemen, taking the weight of the skull down, bowing the neck a bit forward and straining the larynx. And that he discovered that if he could keep the weight of the skull back and up off the end of the, the neck and the, the, the spine, then there was no distortion to his voice. In fact, his voice got better, bigger, and fuller. So people started coming to him for voice lessons. And at some apocryphal dinner party, a doctor said, well, that's funny, I have a patient who has back problems with no apparent cause. I wonder what your technique would do for her. He helped her with her back problems. And so to this day, the technique has come down to us for people in the performing arts who want to sing, dance, play an instrument more effectively, 
also it helps people who have pain, so it's a form of physical therapy. However, it's not called therapy or performance, it's think thought of as education, kinesthetic education. I got into it mid-career because I have my own back problems and scoliosis in particular, and I thought it would help me. And in my training, I, as I read the works and started thinking about the th philosophy that's behind this, this technique, I saw that there was something hidden in this argument. And here it is, that argument, they assume y that humans cannot sit upright without back support. Now, people all over the world sit up without back support. Now, admittedly, Buddha here is in stone, so he's not feeling any pain, but you get the point. People do sit upright all over the world, and y we see this depicted in art. I photographed it myself in Cairo some years ago. Of course, there's Japan, famous for floor sitting, and so forth and so on. So then we have to ask if not everybody practices chair sitting, not everybody needs this little chair back, why do we and where did it come from? Most furniture historians are going to take you here to the pharaohs and say it's their fault. They sat on a single thing with four legs and a small back, that's a chair. Also in the Fertile Crescent, uh, the Assyrian kings also sat in thrones. And so that's a pretty good argument. So I went around to the archaeology department on campus and I said, well, hmm, you know, these were very advanced civilizations. The sociologist in me knew this. So there might have been something before these advanced civilizations that we where we could find out more about chairs. Oddly, the uh, archaeologist said, you know, we've never thought about where chairs came from. Uh, it's a good question. I have no, no clue. But there was a graduate student who knew about a recent find in the former Yugoslavia of little kiln-fired figures of about this yay, yay tall, and they are only of women, and they only are in women's graves. So um, the, the pharaohs take and the king take, take us back to about 2500 BC. So it looks like chairs are about 5,000 years old, but no, these are from 7,500. So that makes them double what we thought. Um, we, so then I ask, okay, what if this is Neolithic village. What about a Paleolithic, the old Stone Age, before the last big freeze? And they say, well, what we know from that period is caves, cave paintings. Those are almost always animals. Once in a while, only a human. Even less often a tool, but never a chair. So we may never know exactly who sat in the first chair. But I do dare say that what we can say is that chairs seem to have had some relationship to role differentiation. In this case, women, um, and the other cases it was rulers. But why, you know, the fact that it's only women and only in women's graves means something is going on about role differentiation. I would say status brought in more generally. And I think that we are stuck with that to this day. Um, Chairs are still so strongly associated with status in our minds, so that if you won't show somebody respect, you offer them a seat. You know, secretary, you come into an office, secretary says, have a seat. She means to show respect. She's not really asking you to die early, but you'll see later that, in fact, she's asking you to die early. But anyway, I think because of this association between these little objects and status, we have not been able to think clearly and rationally about chairs and the chair-based way of life. So let's give it a whirl. First, uh, we'll now we'll go forward. Um, the Greece um, brought us the klismos, and furniture historians like it because they like the fact that the leg, where's my little red dot again? Where'd the red dot go? There it is. Okay, the, the leg and the back are integrated, and they think this is a nice relaxed form of sitting, as opposed to the pharaoh who is sitting up erect. I s disagree, I think this is the first form of slumping, uh, and I don't think there's a particular virtue in it. I think the pharaoh set up 
not because artists didn't know how to depict yielding ease, but because pharaohs had a job. They were between gods and humans, and they were supposed to communicate between them. And I don't know any meditation tradition in the world where slumping is a way to meditate. Do you? You, you let me know if you ever hear of one, because in my understanding, you regulate posture in order to regulate consciousness. And I think maybe, you know, let's, just say use the, let's just say those pharaohs thought of themselves as antenna trying to reach, um, getting, to get higher information. So posture was not an, because artists didn't know what they were doing. Um, okay, forward. And the Romans brought us this piece of furniture, the um, um, basically a way to lie down, and this is how all social life was conducted. Even if this is a rich person's house, obviously, but even a stone bench with um, with straw on it uh, would be the way that people conduct social life, even in poorer households. The triclinium is a Roman invention. It's the three-sided inclined thing um, on which nine people meet for bef banquets. You Three are here, three are here, and three are here, each on a big pillow, a bolster. How many know the word bolster? My students have lost the word. The same, as Swedish. same in Swedish? Cool, because my students don't remember. They've They've lost it. I have to say big pillow for them. Okay, so you lie on this big pillow, which is upholstered. You bring your own napkin, interestingly, to protect that. And the cool little, well, let's, you get, if there's stuff you don't eat, you get to wrap it up in the, your napkin and take it home like a kind of ancient doggy bag. I think that's a fun little detail. But here's the main thing. You've got three heads here, three here, here. So you've got a very intimate, uh, head eye contact. Food is served here, on, uh, and wine is served here. Initially, women were not allowed in these. If later, they did were allowed. But this is, in fact, how the Last Supper would have taken place. Bec they assure me that the language that Jesus lay in the bosom of so and so only makes sense if you assume this semi-reclined position. But as our our culture changed more and more to a chair and table cu culture. Our artists changed the depiction of the event from a historical accuracy to something that was closer to our, our culture. Um, it's in the Middle Ages, uh, supposedly everything died out and chairs, like all furniture, w had to be reinvented. And when it was reinvented, once again, the king is the guy who's a little elevated and everybody else is down here. We'll leap forward to the 18th century, which furniture historians view as the nicest, best period. And they like it because um, the leg and the back are visually integrated. There's a little comfort here, the rounded front rail, a little bit of horsehair uh, for padding, and of course the elaborate symbolic, the elaborate backs. So we get art and comfort fused and they think that's a good thing. They don't like this. This is an another, this is a 19th century event, which is the invention of spring coil upholstery, boinky boink. Two bad things there um, from 20th century point of view. We don't like hiding structure, and this one hides all of its structure. And, you know, we think it's too ornate. But to remember that upholstery had been a real luxury until the Industrial Revolution. So now that everybody could have these elaborate fabrics, they all wanted them. So this is popular. But from a body conscious point of view, they're also not so hot because when you're on a spring, you the sit bones don't carry your weight, and your bones are designed for carrying weight, not your flesh. If you get something pressing up around your flesh and making it try to do load bearing that it can't really do, all it does is reduce the circulation of fluids, blood and, and, and um, lymph. So it's bad on m aesthetic counts and, and, and uh, body counts. 19, um, we, 20th century tends to like this 19th century contribution, the steamed wood of the thon tonnet um, uh, 
Bentwood. Generally, here we are in the 20th century. I would say the 20th century was an era of a century of experimentation with new materials, but the body got completely left out. You know, Va Kandinsky and uh, Breuer had a sort of aha moment one day seeing a bike go by, and he said, why can't I use this new material, this new piping that made the bikes, new strong tubing, why can't I use that for a chair? So he made the Seska that we, have all, we all still sit on today. And then for his painter friend, he made Kandinsky, he made this, the Vasily chair, also using that same kind of tubing with a traditional material like leather, but from a body point of view, it's, it's rather awkward. Um, it's hard to get out of, you're, um, you're taken off your center of gravity, you'll probably bring your head forward and you probably fold in your chest. Not to be outdone, Mies van der Rohe did this for the Barcelona Pavilion, and I, for a long time I couldn't understand why, my little gizmo here, oh yeah, why this part was so deep, because if you sit in this and go all the way back there to your, with your back, you can't, your knees would bend around here, so your legs have to sit straight out. Or if you sit so that your knees can actually bend here, your pelvis is about here, and then she would get a rounded slump trying to reach the back. I figured this guy must have been really tall. He must have had really long thighs. I got some photos. Guess what? He's really tall. He has <laughs> really long thighs. He, this reverses your lumbar curve. It's exactly the opposite of what you would want. Furniture historians think it's cool because it harkens back to the klismos because of the X, but from a body point of view, it's a disaster as is this from 1950. It's a bag. Three Argentinian architects designed this, uh, taking advantage of the strength, the tensile strength of these new metals. But I understand from people who have kids, it's really okay if you have an infant because they can't, at a dinner party, can put them there and they really can't roll out. <laughs> but for the rest of us, like we're hanging around, you know, in a bag, you might say, well, that's cool, that's like a hammock. But I, you know, from a Chinese point of view, you think about the welfare of the organs first. We culturally think mostly about skeleton. You know, our metaphor for the basic is skeletal crew. You know, that's like stripped down. Mm. But, you know, actually, embryologically, the gut tube is formed first and the organs come off that. Organs really are first. And in Chinese medicine, you think about their welfare to do health. And, uh, here, your organs are all like sitting on top of one another, kind of scrunched, and so I don't think it's so hot. Um, this one won a prize, Organic Chair Competition, 1950, MoMA, uh, by Saarinen, and it's curved, and I guess that's why it's called organic. But if you think about what's good for the organism, curved is not so hot. If this is your, this is your pelvis, and these are your sit bones, and you sit on something soft, you have a slight coming together. If you sit on something planar and firm, you have a slight opening. Creating more space is better. It's the same principle for the back. If you wrap around the rib cage, you t slightly take the rib cage in. If you have the rib cage leaning on something flat, you have an option to have it slightly open, and that's preferable. But we get confused because we are curved. We think a curved support is good for us, but it's actually not. You uh, Scandinavians um, have your own kind of spin on, um, on modern furniture design. It's a tour de force, look moi, one piece of wood, and I get both the seat and the back out of the one piece. But here, it's curved around the hips, so you're slightly turned in on yourself. And if you have any back problems, like I do, uh, that thing up there is like a knife blade. Uh, and then the new plastics hit the scene. That's another new material we like to play with. This is a chair. It is in the Museum of Modern Art as a chair, as, all, as are all the ones we just looked at. Um, but you get the idea. We're fascinated by the new materials, and we have inflatables from 68. Along th and then, just in case you're so uncivilized as to think you might want to go to the beach and lie down, this is here to save you. You tuck this under your arm, you take the New York Times with you, and you sit at the beach like a proper civilized person. So mm, where did I get this jaundiced view of the history of modern chair design? As I told you, it kind of came from the Alexander Technique. 
And after my first year, I actually ran a seminar. I decided that in order to survive as a professor of environmental design and take three years to do full-time Alexander training, I'd better find a topic where body and environment meet. And I thought, well, there's clothes, and then there's tools that we touch, and then there's furniture. And furniture's a little more architectural in scale, and every architect has tried their hand at designing a chair, so I'll just study chairs. And I ran a seminar to look at everything about chairs. So we looked at social history, style history, ergonomics, construction and manufacture, storage systems, all this stuff. And that summer, after my first year of Alexander training and after my first seminar on chairs, I was left with confusion about the ergonomic literature. All the rest I sort of got, but the ergonomic stuff was full of contradictions. How high should the seat be? Some don't say very low, some say 18 inches, some say even higher. How much of a back should there be? Should there be lumbar support? Should there be arms? You know, there was yes and no on every issue. Should the seat be flat, canted forward, tipped back? Every issue had competing research. So there I was, still scratching my head, and I w went to England to visit friends whom I, I had studied in England for one year when I was in college. And so I was visiting this friend from that time who had gone to Africa to teach English. And I was looking at these slides with my new Alexander eyes, and I'm going, oh yeah, okay, some have better carriage than others, they're just like us, there's a lot of variation. And then there was this one guy who was different than all the others. He, his spine was like erect, his head led, but it didn't drag his neck forward. His neck was still an extension of his spine. His shoulders were right down the middle of the chest, not forward in clerical stoop, nor pinned back in military excess, just gracefully down, chest very deep, like wow, really impressive. And there was one other guy like him that I picked out of this pile of photos. And my friend said, not knowing about my semester of studying chairs, she said, that's funny, the two you picked out are two that grew up in a village that didn't have a missionary school. So they never sat at, a ta at tables and chairs. Do you, do you hear the drum roll? That or the little trumpet? That was the birth of the hypothesis. Oh, so it's not good chair design or bad chair design. It's something is wrong with chairs. And I've got to figure out what it is. So I went back to the university with renewed vigor and, <laughs> and um, started reading medical rehabilitation literature and keeping track of all the problems that are actually caused by chairs. And the list got longer and longer and longer and longer. And I thought, okay, so what's the, uh, you know, what's the abs, what's the bottom line here? What is it? And finally, I did figure out that it has to do with this angle. Let me just go back a second and just point out, that's the woman up there, um, and that's her kid at the time. And notice that all of us uh, have this nice, whoops, um, I want to make a point here that this has nothing to do with race. We all uh, have perfect use uh, until at least 18 months. We are, are, these joints are free so that the limbs can work freely, but the back stays back. It's not distorted by any of the limbs. The neck continues up, the he eyes and the senses are interested in the outside world, but not distorting and pulling the neck way forward. So this is our birthright. We all have this. We lose this. We don't have to lose it. Some people keep it all their lives, like Muhammad Ali the great fighter, or great pianist, Fred Astaire, the great dancer, they keep it. Most of us lose it depending on class, race, culture, and by race I mean ethnicity, cultural, uh, I mean r culture, and, um, and family dynamics and psychological issues. Um, so what happened, you know, what's at the base of it all? Okay, it's really that the right angle seated posture. The 90 degrees makes the muscles, these muscles here, pull on the back of the, your pelvis and pull it back. And then you flatten your lumbar curve. 
When you stand, you have an elongated S-shaped spine. Now, if you have a heavy load, like a head, on the letter C versus on the letter S, tell me which form is stronger, the S or the C? The S is stronger, yes. So we want that elongated double S in the spine. The good news is that when you sit, when you s your what I call perch, halfway between sitting and standing, you keep the virtues of the standing spine. But you probably are able to sit on a little something and rest your legs. Standing is tiring to the legs. Sitting is very stressful to the back. But the good news is there is a position in between. But before we get to the good news, I'm going to give you some more terrible news. Sitting is now, there have been big epidemiological studies that have come out the last five years um, that show that the hours, for every hour that you sit over three hours, you contribute another 11% to your chance of early mortality from good, from heart attack, stroke, or cancer. What's the mechanism? Let me see. Oh, if I want to, okay. So people sit way too much. I want to get to the one that tells you why. Yes, it's the good enzymes that break down fat, drop by 90%. Something about inactivity in the leg muscles tells the pancreas here to quit producing a key enzyme called lipase, L-I-P-A-S-E, Without that enzyme, well, that, that enzyme usually is, is supposed to go to the liver and help the liver deal with fats. Without that enzyme, the liver can't break down fats, so undigested fats end up going into the blood system. That's what sets us up for heart attack, stroke, and cancer. These effects are very um, vigorous. Or, um, st what is this the word we use for not vigorous? Um, um, they're strong, and um, um, they hold, they're stronger than uh, any correlation with age, stronger than correlation with being fat, and here's the real kicker, stronger than correlation with smoking. So sitting is actually now con been proved to be a greater cause of mortality than smoking. And here's the even perhaps the worst piece of news. It's the absolute number of hours that you sit that does the damage. You don't compensate by going to the gym. Doesn't matter. It's the absolute number of hours that you sit. That's what the research is showing. So this means we all have like a very precious little sitting budget of about three hours that you want to spend very carefully. But do we? No. So talk about design problem. You want to redesign. You want work for the rest of your life? Let's start tackling this problem. How do we work in new ways, and how do we conduct public life in new ways? Yeah, okay, so, you know, TV, I mean, eating, transit, work, movies, I mean, you name it. Um, now, oddly enough, there is a guy um, uh, who discovered that it's, better to slump than to sit like this. Yeah, it's better to slump, but to be why? Because you're reproducing the 135. This is 90, you know, standing is 180. You want sort of 135, 120, something like that. It turns out, I disagree with this, it's vastly better to do th it this way, to have the 135 with the torso erect, than to do it this way, because you all end up collapsing a whole bunch of other stuff in this, in this position. Okay, so in NASA, um, they call this neutral body posture. When there's no gravitational force on your body, when you're out in s outer space floating around, nothing is pulling you, this is how you are, because this balances the musculature of the front and the back of the body. This is neutral. So this is what we kind of want. I like that 128, it doesn't have to be 135, see? An American surgeon was interested in the problem of slip, slipped discs. How many have known somebody with a slipped disc? Ooh, lots in this room. Woo, woo. Okay, slipped discs, by the way, they never seem to go forward. Notice that? 
They're always, because the lumbar curve is reversed, and they always go that way, and they press on the spinal cord and cause intense pain. So he's interested in them, and he starts looking at what happens to the behavior whoops, of, of these uh, vertebrae here in different postures. Lying on your side is the best, A, that's this one. And this is sort of a kind of a 135, as is this. So note here that squatting is better than sitting, wildly better than sitting. Only thing worse than sitting is sitting with your legs up or bending over like this. You might wonder about squatting. We look down on people who squat. But there the, uh, the, the spine is proportionately lengthened, whereas when you sit, you only reverse the lumbar curve and it's under compression. When you squat, the tail can continue to drop even, uh, even though you, it looks like you're flattening the spine, but you're flattening the whole thing proportionately. So I think that's why squatting is superior to sitting. So, uh, nevertheless, this is what we continue to do. Designers, in order to stop that forward slide that we talked about at the very beginning, you know, they can't the front of the seat up. This, this chair that you're sitting on has taken that strategy. S can't take the front higher than the back so to stop that inevitable forward slide. And then they notice that it's not a good thing to have uh, a less than, once you can't the thing up in the front, you've you've created even less than 90 degrees, right? So they say, oh, well then we'll open the back. So they open the back, and if you accept the trajectory of the back, this, your head would be out about here. That's not tenable, of course, so he brings his head forward. But the spine, let's look at it. The spine's still going back to about here. Then it takes a sharp bend forward. And so in time, this will become fixed. After years of sitting like this, it'll become fixed, and he will have a dowager's hump. And you'll say, oh, well, you have to get old somehow. It has nothing to do with age. It's a cultural practice produced by an artifact that we impose on ourselves. We insist on this s ideal up here, and this is the reality. And now, this guy's got extra problems because his focal length is a little short, it looks like. Kids have a focal length of only 12 inches, adults 24. When we make kids work on a flat surface like this, we force them to round their spines in order to see. Terrible. You, we need to raise the whole thing up and have it slanted like this. And y adults need that too. We just insist in this ridiculous contradiction. Okay, so graphic standards still is going to tell us this is how it should be. You've all seen graphic standards, right? This is nonsense. Peter Opsvik, Norwegian designer, uh, listened to the Danish physician, Dr. Mandel, who wrote Homo Sedens and just also figured out that you need this uh, 135 degree. Uh, but, and he, inv so Opsvik invented the, the balance chair. How many have sat on a balance chair? How many like a balance chair? Fewer, <laughs> fewer. Well, it, back it does what? That's weird. Yeah. That's strange. Yeah. Hmm. Well, well, um, you're taking advantage of this. Now, why does he have you on your knees? Anybody know? Can I guess? This is called the most radical chair design of the 20th century, and in many ways it is. But I say it's profoundly conservative. Why? He knows that this is good. But if we're going to work in this position, we can't work at normal desk type height or counter height. And so we'd have to change everything. Now you'd think designers would love this, that you have to change everything. But there's a c cultural conservatism. You change one piece that requires you change another piece. It doesn't work, so culture holds itself in place. They noticed, oh they said, okay, so how can we have this advantage Take advantage of this, but lower the body in space enough to be able to use the desks that are down here. So th that's why the folding was invented, simply to get the leg shorter. But it's not really that great to lean on this shin. It's not really designed to be a load bearer. 
a, a little bit is okay. And it's not that wonderful to lose proprioceptive feedback from the soles of your feet. So that, that's why I call this conservative, because it's conserving this investment that we have in this vast infrastructure of counters, dining room tables, desks, and so forth at the height that we have known them. But nevertheless, you see, it is better than the right angle. Let's see what it does here to this guy's spine. This was from Sweden a long time ago, showing that uh, how nurses are and physical therapists are taught to administer um, physical therapy rather than bending and hurting their own spine to use the position of mechanical advantage. It's called mechanical advantage in the Alexander technique because that's what it gives you. It's called neutral body posture by NASA and in the martial arts it's also known as the horse because you're stronger in this position than you are standing. You know, it's easier to be pushed over this way than this way. It's much harder to be pushed. So um, they're taking advantage of that. However, for us, look, what are you going to do? Everybody wants storage space under their sink. You know, it's like, you know, this guy's going to lose his kneecaps uh, if he tries to do that. I did find, I s tell everybody, only pedestals, pedestal sinks, please. But I found this in New Zealand, half storage, but still room for flexing your legs. Other reforms, the Italian physio balls people were keen on. Peter Opsvik again, the Capisco chair with cutouts at the corners so that you're, you can be in the perch position. Uh, how many have tried the Capisco by Peter Opsvik? One, two, maybe three. You like it? A lot like it? Yes, no? Yeah? I, I like it. For me, it works really well. I don't have the piece at the back. Uh, this is another one by a Finnish designer. Um, it's called the Sali, S-A-L-L-I. And there the idea is that you actually want to mobilize the two pelvic halves. And he has the idea that you want genital freedom, especially for men. So no compression. In, and he's pretty serious about that. Uh, and I take his word for it. He's the guy. I'm not. So uh, I, an Italian physician thought this was so important that to be even... Th the, the littlest, e even a few degrees off of 90 degrees helps. Just even a few. Every so she just had these simple wooden chairs adjusted. So you don't have to go to the 135 if you can't. Just, you know, a, t a tiny bit. So on a chair like this, what would I do? I would put... some nice stack of things like this or book, you know, I would put a book, I'll s demo for everybody. I would do something like that. So then I'm not getting cut under here and I'm being raised up enough. It's still not ideal because it's still too close to 90 degrees. So what I might do even is sit right out, this is my gorilla ergonomics of uh, lesson 101. Sit at the very end of an ordinary chair and drop one leg. You can't drop two at the same time or you'll fall. <laughs> but you can take turns going to 135. And you'll be surprised. You do this, if you do it right now, like sit here at the very edge in full 90 degrees regalia, just like you're supposed to according to graphic standards. And tune into the amount of muscle work you're doing at the small of your back. Make your own internal measure. Then just drop one of your knees. And you'll feel some kind of a shift. It's pro much more profound if you can do it with both. The best demo is to have somebody sit in a chair like this and then sit on a stool that's this high. And then you see it, uh, you feel it instantly across both sides. So there's no confusion. It's, it's a radical, radical difference in the amount of work that you do. Um, but sometimes you just have to use the whole surface, in which case I would sit on something. But otherwise, I would do this. Or maybe make it even higher. Uh, yes, already. See, just even that little change, there's less strain here. And then if I do this, I make it even less strain, straining. And 
you know, maybe keeping your legs a little active will help you with the problem of dying from seating. <laughs> okay, so uh, this was Sweden years ago too. I was impressed to see bars at different heights with correspondingly different stool heights. I'm running out low on time. Mama bear, papa bear, baby bear sizes. Why don't we have in public places three, four, five sizes? Why not? What's the big deal? School furniture, uh, new European standards promoted by Mandel, not often understood. I've spoken Aarhus a decade ago, and the students said, oh, so that's why we had those funny chairs. Nobody even told them what it was about. So there needs still to be a, a lot of education done. You can fiddle with heights the, uh, at the foot end of the story, at the head end. Bologna, they know that you shouldn't work on a flat surface. Americans are trying, but the forms are ugly. <laughs> uh, lying down in public is something that we should be able to do. Women especially have a hard time, but anybody who lies down at work will be viewed as lying down on the job. But, you know, it really, rather than coffee to jack up your nervous system, it might be better to spend that 15-minute break lying down and lengthening your spine and opening your rib cage. So, but here, there's gender issues uh, to do this. <laughs> Peter Opsvik also designed this thing called the gravity, and, and I like it. I, I don't like the first two, but I like the lounge one because, look, if this is bad and this is good, now we rotate good in space, what do we get? A chaise long? Yes, we get a chaise long, or I don't know, what do you call them here? Okay. That's the one from 1925 that Corbusier did with Charlotte Perriand. I always have to say that because all his other chairs are terrible from a body point of view, and this one's good, so it must be because of her. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just speculating. It's Athena talk, right? I mean, so I can say this. <laughs> all right. So the Finns were the first people to realize that you could, un once, the, once the keyboard was uncoupled from the monitor, that then you could go into a lounge position to work. And in fact, I work in a lounge position myself. This is uh, another uh, step forward, I believe. It's by an American designer uh, who designed um, uh, Keen Sandals. Um, and then he sold that business, and now he does this. It's called Focal Upright. That, pi that thing pivots. This thing pivots, and you put your feet there, so you're quite active. That, so that, if, if it's that, the muscles, keeping these muscles active, that tells the pancreas to produce the lipase, this may be a life-saving saving device. Life -saving device. The height goes up and down with a crank. Not, you have to do it yourself, and the slope is adjustable. Focal upright, F-O-C-A-L, upright. But this guy in San Francisco bikes to work <laughs> and then uses it as a seat, so that may be the ultimate. In my own house, I decided to try to integrate this into a living room and have it so that I could do constructive rest position as well as read, as well as have a seminar, as well as have a fake Chinese, Japanese experience. I designed a bathtub with my brother that holds the neck so the spine can lengthen. Um, Peter Opsvik went back to some conventional height chairs but tried to create active legs, which is probably going to be important. Put these these bars there so that you push with your feet. And here in a public space, rockers in an airport, everybody needs a rocker in their house. You move your ankle, your knee, your hip, and your spine and your neck. It's, they're very valuable. And it's great to see them in public. I taught a class called High Style Body Conscious Chair Design at Anderson Ranch in Colorado. This was sort of best of show. Two perches in one. And one student wanted a rocker, but he said they took up too much space for small apartments, so he wanted a foldable rocker. And I, when I did my Alexander training in New York, decided to go cold turkey off of chairs. How did I do it? I said, okay, I'll sit on stools. When I get tired, I will lie down in constructive rest. As Soon as it's hurt hurtful, I'll lie down. It took me two months, and by two months, I could sit indefinitely. But I didn't do it in a day. I set up, um, it was just the days of telephones, you know, old-fashioned landlines. So I set that up 
uh, as a standing height. Harvard's uh, Graduate School of Design has these carpeted stairs. That's another body-friendly alternative. And here in Northern California, one school has decided that all the kids will just have stand-up desks based on this research about the mortality links with sitting. And here is somebody's concept. This is an art, you know, architect's concept. I don't think it's as good as that, those little kids because there's no knee space here, but you know, it's a provocative image of not sitting. Here is another public uh, application. Students at uh, um, Virginia Polytechnic uh, heard my lecture and went, they had to figure out, they wanted to find ways to animate spaces on their campus. So this is a landscape idea that you mold the earth to create um, 135 degrees for the people inside, and then also you could do it, individuals could do it here. So this would be for private, for reading, and this would be for group activity and discussion inside. I thought they were smart. I designed a chair uh, on the core Perian principles, but not in sp with springs or leather. I asked how could I make it equally comfortable in unyielding wood, and it was so popular that it's the only one that was stolen in the show. <laughs> I, I decide that it must be a compliment, yeah? <laughs> I'm ending with this image um, of a problem that occurred in Santa, Bar yeah, Santa Barbara in California, where people were coming to watch sunset with a six pack of beer, sitting at the cliff edge and eroding the cliff edge. So the planners could have put up a cyclone fence to stop that. But instead, they were smart. They hired an artist and an architect to build this raft about 30 feet back from the cliff edge to make it just slightly more attractive to sit and work here. So there's a picnic bench, as you see, and then they built this in so that your head is up, you can still watch the sun go down and be with your buddy, drink your beer, and your body's in better shape too. So my fervent hope is that if we can become more sensitive and kind to the need to ourselves and pay more attention to the needs of our bodies we might also become kinder to the needs of the earth that allow us to be here in the first place thank you for your attention mm -hmm.